Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Vaccine 411. I'm Chris Baxter-Ging, one of the city's public information officers, and I'm going to take off my mask. Everyone who's here today is vaccinated, and we're all at least six feet apart from each other. Our team today is striving to bring you the latest information about COVID-19 and how to stay safe. Today's program is one more way we are trying to do just that. We're live at Tempe City Hall with three people who are COVID-19 experts in our community. Assistant Chief Andrea Glass may not look like it, but she's been with Tempe Fire Medical Rescue for more than 20 years, 16 of those as a paramedic. She served as medical services training captain, medical services deputy chief, and support services deputy chief before her promotion. Each summer, she volunteers her time to work at a camp that serves children who are burn survivors. She's on track to receive a dual master's degree at Grand Canyon University in 2023. That on top of everything that she's already doing. She'll be serving as today's host. Thank you for your time today, Chief. We also have with us Nick Els. Nick Els is our deputy chief. He has 24 years experience as a firefighter, 13 of those as a paramedic. About 84% of all the emergency calls in Tempe are medical in nature and Deputy Chief Ellis supervisors the medical services section, which includes COVID-19 responses. As part of that effort, he acts as Tempe's liaison with area doctors, hospitals, Maricopa County Public Health, and Arizona Department of Health Services. He also trains Tempe's emergency responders on how to respond to COVID-19 calls. Thank you for being here today, Deputy Chief Nichols. And Dr. Joshua LaBaire, Executive Director at ASU Biodesign Institute is here. He leads ASU's team that brought the country's first publicly available COVID saliva test and so much more. We are so grateful to him for being here today and we'll give him a more thorough introduction a little later in the program. Our experts will discuss with you some of the most common questions surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines. If you have a question during any point in this program, type it in the comments of the Facebook post. Time permitting, we will answer it during the program. But if not, we'll offer a response later. We'll put it in the comments of Facebook. And we're going to share with you the latest statistics about COVID-19 rates in our community and show you how we use that data to make informed decisions. We'll answer some of the most commonly asked questions that we've seen and then answer some of the questions that people have directly sent us in particular for this event. And again, Dr. LeBaire will be addressing some of the issues regarding ASU and some of the vaccine reliability and testing processes and all of the more scientific things that are going on in our community. ASU is leading the world in our COVID-19 efforts and we are so lucky, so fortunate, and so happy to have them as part of our community. And with that, I'll turn it over to Assistant Chief Glass. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate that. And for all who were here for the Vaccine 401 initially, um, now we're in a different place and we're so happy to have you back here. For anybody new um, that's joining us, thank you for tuning in and taking the time to learn a, a little bit more about vaccines and about what is going on currently with uh, COVID-19 within our own community. We are going to look specifically to Tempe um, as we talk today and the data that's associated with the Tempe zip codes. Um, so we will proceed forward. If you at any time want to obtain this information, you can always go to tempe.gov slash indicators, and that will provide the information or you could follow along on your own computer if you'd like to and, and see the information closer up. But um, we will go through some of the indicators that we've looked at from the start of the pandemic. Um, as things have proceeded with Arizona Department of Health Services and benchmarks, CDC guidelines and benchmarks, and what we've developed as a dashboard here within Tempe uh, to provide that information in a user-friendly manner. So as we go through, we'll first look at the COVID-19 positive test. Um, this initially, if you could please move on to the first slide or to the next slide, Chris. Thank you. Okay, so COVID-19 positive test. Here we have it broken down into the various zip codes um, from 85281 through to 85284. And what this is tracked from um, quite some time ago are the weekly percent positive cases. Within each of those zip codes, we do obtain this information from Arizona Department of Health Services and Maricopa County Public Health. 
and we want to make sure that we provide that information to our community members. As you can see with the um, cases, we also look at the cases per 100,000. And if you could just go back one, one slide, my apologies. Um, when we look at the cases um, percent positivity, you can see in 85281, 85282, and 85283 um, that we're in the high range when it comes to the transmissibility of the disease right now and the percent positivity, all of those above 13%. And in 85284, we're at 9.5%. And the reason I wanna mention this as we get further in the program is that our vaccine rates in 85284 are actually our highest vaccine area and that's where we have the lowest percent positivity. So I do wanna mention that as we're going through that and you look at the various zip codes and the data associated with it, that we do have higher cases per 100,000, higher percent positivity in 85281, 85282, 85283 than we do in 85284. Um, just wanna add that information to support vaccines within our community. Um, as we proceed forward, the cases per 100,000, unfortunately with this, we are in the high range for transmissibility within our community in all four zip codes. Um, the only one that is below 200 cases per 100,000 are the 85284 um, zip code. Um, but otherwise we are, are still around the 228 to, the, uh, to our highest, which is 85283 right now at 322 cases per 100,000. And looking at Maricopa County as a state, or I'm sorry, as a county within the state, and looking at CDC's site earlier today, um, for the county, we're at about 298 cases per 100,000. So we're on track with what is occurring within the county. Um, another data set that we look at is our own specific calls for the fire department. Um, for fire medical rescue, we run um, EMS calls, which are med emergency medical services. And we track anything that suspected COVID-19 cases or confirmed COVID-19 cases. So we can use that data. So this screen right here that you're seeing is the data that's associated from calls that come through the 911 emergency system and that our crews respond to um, and take care of and possibly transport to the hospital. So this shows a trend of how we see the COVID impacting um, our call volume and calls for service that are specific to COVID-19. And the way that we're able to um, track that information is we do have call takers that will ask if the person has signs and symptoms of COVID-19, if they are known to be COVID positive, um, or if we do follow up with the hospital care system and we do find that they have tested positive for COVID. So that gives us the information and the data that's associated with this slide that you see here. And we can track that data set and that information to see how our call volume is doing um, in comparison with what's going on within our own city. The next set of information is the wastewater data. We were fortunate enough to partner with ASU Biodesign Institute and partner for wastewater data. This originated with the opioid um, data collection and then has transferred or, or transcended into um, being able to look at COVID biomarkers within the wastewater. Um, this is revolutionary, I think, and extremely innovative when you look at disease processes and what occurs within the community. We're very fortunate to have it here in Tempe. And this gives us an extremely early indicator of what is occurring within our community and where we can start to see increases of COVID-19 in various regions or areas of our city. As you can see, there's a map that has various areas that are broken up to, and those are the test sampling sites. And so they are able to take and test um, the wastewater in those sampling areas to look for levels of COVID-19. What's great about this data and this information is it's not reliant on somebody testing positive for COVID or going to get tested. Um, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, the body will shed the virus into the wastewater and then we can collect and, and use that information to see what truly is going on in our community um, whether somebody gets treated, gets evaluated, or gets tested, we get an accurate and early reflection of what is occurring in the wastewater. So we've been um, looking at this, focusing on this, and really trying to see where our city is going when it comes to COVID-19 and this pandemic. Another great thing um, to mention with the wastewater data is that the city of Tempe did recently receive a $1 million grant from the Arizona Department of Health Services to continue this wastewater data collection and sampling which is incredibly promising for us to be able to look at not only COVID-19, 
but hopefully other biomarker indicators in the future um, for healthcare. So we're extremely excited about that. Um, this has been a great project, a huge collaborative effort between the city of Tempe and ASU's Biodesign Institute, and we are grateful for it. So that is the information that we have associated with wastewater data that we look at and have a dashboard associated with it as well. The final um, slide or information that we will speak to is the vaccina vaccination rates in Tempe. Again, this is broken down into the zip codes and we received this information Mar from Maricopa County Department of Public Health. Um, and it breaks it down into first dose of eligible population and second dose of eligible population. Um, second dose being fully vaccinated. So that does account for the Johnson & Johnson, which is only one shot versus two. Um, so that's why you will see the second dose or fully vaccinated um, when it comes to these data sets. Um, for 85281, that's the area where we have the least amount of vaccinations right now. And we're really trying to do a push and have been trying to do a push to increase the vaccinations with the first dose being at 50.1% and fully vaccinated only at 44.9%. Our highest I referenced earlier was uh, 85284. And in that we have first dose at 74.1% and the second dose at 68.3% uh, fully vaccinated. Um, within the Tempe, city of Tempe, we're trying um, to achieve a goal of 75% vaccinated by Labor Day. And so a very aggressive goal that we're trying to accomplish here, 85284 is very close. Um, so we're hoping to do that extra little push to get them up there. Um, but you can see 85281, 85282, and 85283, we've got a lot of work to do. And that's part of why we wanted to come here today and provide the information uh, for you so that you understand more about the vaccine, the benefits of it, and um, can answer some of the questions or concerns you may have. Um, again, if you would like any of this information, tempe.gov slash indicators is where you can find any of the data sets that we've used along the way. It's helped guide us through um, trying to keep this community safe and provide information that's readily available to anybody. So what I would like to do now is we will transfer over and bring Chief Ells into the conversation. And the first thing I would like to know is what is Tempe doing to stop the spread of COVID? That's a good answer. That's a good question, Chief Glass. We're doing everything that we can. During the beginning of the pandemic, it started out with a partnership between us and ASU's Biodesign um, to present uh, COVID saliva testing clinics in our highly, uh, highly infected but um, areas and within Tempe so that we had those um, we had we we had the, that information. We had that ability to um, keep people safe. We had that ability to do that outreach. Um, and as as everything evolved and vaccinations um, evolved, we started uh, identifying who our vulnerable populations were within the city. When we identified those vulnerable populations and demographics, we started holding uh, vaccination clinics for them specifically. We we're able to identify that um, you know some people, especially the elderly maybe don't have internet access, maybe don't have the knowledge of computers that the younger generation does now. And instead of trying to make appointments for each one of them at one of these larger sites, we're able to hold a vaccination clinic uh, for them and take care of it with city resources. Um, so that's that's one of the big things we've done. Um, one, some of the other things we've done is a, is a big informational push across the city. Um, like you talked earlier about uh, the 85281 and 85282 zip code, these are the uh, the highest infected and the lowest vaccinated areas within the, the city of Tempe. And we want, uh, we want it through a campaign of safe, free, and easy for us to be able to identify, um, you know, where they can get this vaccine, where they can get uh, free COVID testing, where they can get these resources so that they can stay safe, so that their families can be safe, so that we can somewhat return to uh, normalcy, uh, normalcy or, um, or meet our, our goal of 75% by Labor Day. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that you discussed that, that uh, I'm really excited about is, is how, we, how we partnered with ASU and, and pioneered how we use wastewater. Uh, the biomarkers that are, that are uh, able to determine the hotspots here in Tempe uh, that has been a humongous advantage for us in our ability to provide outreach resources to these areas, early warning, which really stops or decreases the, the spread of COVID 
um, early on. Um, and that, that's been one of the greatest things. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at, when we look at, uh, at uh, this next slide, we look at some of the campaigns that we've started. Um, Mask Up Tempe um, is, is one of the big things we've done with, um, uh, we've started newsletters in Tempe uh, since uh, March 12th. We send out about uh, 7,000 emails a week, or I'm sorry, 7,000 residents a week receive emails on uh, information on coronavirus, uh, where vaccination sites are, where saliva testing is, how they can get some of these resources to them because this is not just um, it, it, the, the pandemic isn't something that just affects your health it affects your well-being it affects your mental health it affects um, you know housing it affects your ability to get food and we have those resources here in Tempe and so we have a, a newsletter that we send out once a week uh, we, we urge everybody in the public to sign up for it um, you can go to tempe.gov backslash coronavirus uh, for more information and, and sign up for the newsletter um, when we look at, at uh, the bottom left picture right here, we have Mayor Woods signing an executive proclamation uh, to mandate masks back when we could. When we did this, we took a very layered approach to protecting um, our community and ourselves. Uh, we, we not only mandated masks, but we provided vaccinations for employees. You know, we provided social distancing. We provided tons of information so people make the correct informed decisions. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, some of the things that, that we do here um, within Tempe. Next slide, please. So when we talked earlier, it affects more than health. Um, you know, when people look at a pandemic, a lot of them say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm healthy, I'm young, um, I'm not going to get sick from this. Um, but they don't realize that this isn't, this doesn't just affect, you know, their physical well-being. You know, this affects mental health. This affects everything within the way of life. You know, if you recall, we were locked down for, for quite some time. Um, you know, and, and there's people that had a hard time getting food, people that needed shelter, uh, people that couldn't pay utility bills, people that, you know, lost their jobs, you know, their, their way of life, employment, um, and, and they needed assistance. Here in Tempe, we were able to provide that assistance to a lot of people around our community. Um, but it's it's not something that 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 everybody thinks about, you know. And uh, we want to know we want our community to know that we're there to help them. That these resources um, are available. Um, and I think a really important thing to mention here is, you know, as you were saying that this this impacts everybody. So I think an important thing to mention to just the community is that whether or not you actually have been COVID positive, or if you know somebody who's been COVID positive. The pandemic has impacted everybody in some way, shape, or form, whether mm -hmm. you are um, telecommuting or if you um, have daycare or kids in school, whatever it might be, whether or not you actually personally have dealt with COVID-19 um, as a disease, the impacts and, and the outfall or, or fallout from it um, have really impacted everybody. Um, I know small businesses have been impacted around our community and other businesses in trying to stay afloat. And I know that there's been a, a tremendous amount of resources um, associated with it. One of them, as we see on the screen with uh, tempe.gov slash get help is another avenue. If somebody is struggling through the pandemic and continues to struggle, we have those resources available. Um, again, we have the www.tempe.gov slash coronavirus site that has um, different locations that you can go to, whether you're a small business or, or any other resources that you might need. So I think that's important to mention as you're talking um, and you're talking about all these other things that have been impacted, whether you've had the virus or not, whether you've been vaccinated or not, is it has impacted all of us in mm -hmm. some way, shape or form. So I think that's to remember, it's a good thing to remember as we proceed forward. Um, something else to mention, and this is just a recent um, uh, thing that has occurred today, is face coverings are required indoors at all school sites at the and at the district office um, effective today. Um, so that's just relevant news that we had um, coming out today. And then we want to talk about how COVID-19 is impacting our schools or what we're seeing at our schools right now. Yeah, so COVID-19, it, uh, it really is impacting our, our schools. When we look at um, this you know, from, from our point of view, it, it's 
Um, our schools, and it's not only in our little children, but you know, vaccinations are only available for those that are 12 and older right now. Um, our elementary school age uh, children, you know, they play together, they have fun in the classrooms. Um, and unfortunately, being that close, um, before we, we didn't have masks, we had um, big outbreaks. We had quarantine entire classrooms. Um, if we looked at uh, the 85283 zip code, we had a, a, a class that was uh, completely quarantined. And when we look at the, uh, the numbers for that same time frame, we had a large spike in over 100 numbers just in that zip code alone for that week. Um, and so, you know, we really want to do everything we can and, and, and take a layered approach to protecting our children and our families. Um, when, we, when we talk about protecting our children and, and protecting our families, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of things out there where people think that, you know, your, your kids are young and they're not going to get it. With the new Delta variant, we're seeing that just the opposite. You know, approximately 17,000 children in the U.S. have been hospitalized uh, due to uh, COVID-19 and nearly 400 of them have died. You know, this isn't something that, that they're immune to. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, they're, they're now the vulnerable population. You know, one of the ways that, that, I, that I tell people that they can protect their kids that are not old enough to get vaccinated is vaccinate everybody in your household that is old enough to get it. You know, when they're vaccinated, what we're doing is our part to keep that vaccination from spreading to them. Make sure your kids are wearing a mask. When we take that layered approach, we keep our children safe. We give them the better chance right now. Um, I'm sorry, go back. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to look at was um, when we looked at it uh, across the country, and, and a lot of people might think 17,000 kids isn't a lot, but one in five households have children under the age of 12. And that's, uh, that's a lot. And I, I really want to reinforce with people that you know, the numbers for, the, for kids is going up right now. Please make sure if they're of age and they're eligible to get vaccinated, get them vaccinated. If you have people in your home that are not um, vaccinated, make sure they get vaccinated. Wear your mask. Let's take this layered approach and we can get out of this pandemic together. That's great information. And I know, you know, as we've gone through this pandemic from, from start to now, there's, there's been a tremendous amount of information that has unfolded. Um, there's been a lot of changing information, a lot of directions that have changed. And, you know, so with that, there tends to be a lot of myths that occur. And um, I've, I've heard some doozies through, uh, through the time. <laughs> so what we're going to do is similar to what we did through the first vaccine 411 is we are going to take a look at some of the myths that are out there currently about COVID-19. And, and like, we'd like to bust a few myths, CDC style, I would say, right? Absolutely. All right. All right, so the first one, the first myth we have here is, I want to get pregnant someday, so I'm not getting vaccinated. <laughs> uh, Chief Glass, I'll let you take this one. I don't think that's a good one for you. So, um, so based on what the CDC is recommending, um, people who are pregnant, people who are breastfeeding, um, trying to get pregnant or might become pregnant in the future, they are still stressing to please get vaccinated. Obviously, with anything, it, with a health condition or, or concerns about a health condition, it's always best to consult if you're trying to get pregnant or want to in the future, consult with an OBGYN or your primary care physician. But really what the CDC is recommending for anybody pregnant, breastfeeding, um, trying to get pregnant or um, wanting to be pregnant in the future to please get vaccinated. Okay, so going on to the second one that we hear is vaccines don't work. I know people who have been vaccinated and they still got COVID-19. <laughs> well, this one's a myth as well because vaccines do work and we have Dr. LeBaire here today that's going to explain the science behind uh, vaccines and, and, and how they work. Um, unfortunately, just because uh, you are vaccinated doesn't mean that you can't be infected or that it doesn't work because the science absolutely does uh, show that it works. In fact, when we look at, uh, uh, let's say, the, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, 96% efficacy rate. That is amazing. That is a miracle of modern science, and it is absolutely amazing. When we put that up against the regular flu shot, you know, every year, that's in the 60%, you know, and we're looking at something that is 94%, which still gives you a 6% chance of, of becoming infected. Now, when the Delta variant came down, that efficacy rate dropped to approximately 88% is what we're seeing right now. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't work. 
okay? Even with 88% protection, what we're seeing in hospitals, not only in Tempe and across the state, but across the country, is that it keeps them from getting severe illness and death. You know, when they do contract COVID virus, if they do, then it's, it's a, a very, very mild case for the, for the vast majority of it. So yes, they absolutely do work. Please get them. This is really, really what's gonna help us. And I think you bring up an important part that, or important point with vaccines that, you know, it, it's protecting or it's trying to protect you from actually getting the virus. And if you do get the virus, even when vaccinated, that the symptoms are much less severe um, or, you know, for, can be the difference between hospitalization, not hospitalization. Absolutely. Um, so similar to, to other vaccines that are out there, you know, there's still the potential you get the disease, but, you know, it, it does provide better protection, better barriers from getting it in the first place and then the severity of it once you do get it. So yes. I think that's an important um, point to make when it comes to this. So still definitely good to get that vaccine. Next myth that we have is a good healthy diet and exercise will protect me from COVID-19. <laughs> well, I would say that 430 Olympic athletes who got COVID have a great diet and exercise. And uh, I would say this one is an absolute myth. That speaks for itself. Yeah. To be an Olympic athlete, you've got to have a great diet and exercise. And as we just saw a few weeks ago, 430 of them had COVID. Right. But we still want you to have a good, healthy diet and we exercise. Do. We do. We still advocate a very <laughs> good diet that. and exercise. <laughs> but we also, um, we also really want you to get the vaccine. All right. Our next one we have is masks don't protect you from disease. They cause it. Okay, so, um, you know, early on with uh, with masks, there was speculation and, and where they were thinking that it could cause disease or cause you to become sick um, was there was concerns actually about carbon dioxide. So when you exhale, you breathe out carbon dioxide and they were concerned about there being carbon dioxide collecting inside your mask and then causing you to have heightened levels of carbon dioxide in your body, which is not healthy at extreme high levels. Um, this is something that we would deal with with hazmat calls if there was carbon dioxide being released. Um, this is not what occurs with a mask and when you breathing in and in and out inside a mask. The other thing to consider, and this is where some people might think you're getting sick, is for cloth masks, um, you should be washing your masks regularly. And um, masks do have the potential to collect some bacteria if you're not cleaning your mask and you're not washing those cloth masks. So you do want to wash your cloth masks you do want to let them dry fully before you put them back on um, so you don't have that more musty smell, I would say, you know, <laughs> that you would get from laundry being left wet. But um, so it does not um, cause you to have a disease or cause you to get ill, um, especially if you're cleaning the mask the way you should be. Um, but they do, do help provide better, better protection against disease and the spread of disease. So it is just another barrier. It's another layer of protection um, to help you through this pandemic. And for the last one, and while I appreciate Chris's uh, mentioning of not looking quite as old, um, when people say I'm young, I won't get that sick. I, I think that we've touched on that, but if you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I'm young, I won't get sick. I think a lot of people were operating on the, uh, the misinformation of, hey, the, the, the first time this, we saw this, uh, this virus come around, it, it really targeted the elderly and the sick population kids or younger people weren't really getting it or getting that sick or dying from it. And uh, as we know, viruses evolve and, and Dr. LeBaire is going to talk all about it. They evolved to stay alive. Um, right now, the Delta variant, it's evolved. You know, right now, our younger population are the ones that are the hardest hit. Um, the, the, the kids between two and 12 aren't eligible for the vaccination yet. And so we're seeing really sick kids. And we talked about earlier, 17,000 kids across the country uh, hospitalized due to 400 deaths. Um, when, when the pandemic first, uh, first came out, you know, kids would, would test positive when they would go to the hospital, but it'd be for, for other stuff, you know, appendicitis, and they would just take a, a COVID test and they would test positive. They were asymptomatic. These, this wasn't the big thing then. Right now, when, they're, when kids are going to the hospital, what they're finding, it is their primary diagnosis. They're there because of respiratory depression, respiratory failure, severe illness. It is the primary, uh, the primary disease. 
Um, and so we've really want to debunk this that, yeah, just because you're young doesn't mean that you can't get sick. Um, we, we advocate, please, you know, to protect the young, get vaccinated. And that's not just for the for young kids. This is, you know, we're seeing a large uh, um, infection rate amongst adults uh, or teenagers uh, to adults that are 15 to 44 that don't want the vaccination or I'm sorry, that don't want the vaccine. And these are the highest rates of admittance in the hospital across the country. You know, we can really stop this by getting that vaccination, protecting each other. Okay, so um, one last question, and then we can provide some additional information is how does my vaccination help the community? <laughs> Your vaccination helps the community because you're protecting a way of life. You're protecting yourself, you're protecting your children, you're protecting your neighbors, your family. When we take this multi-layered approach by wearing a mask, by keeping social distance, by having a vaccination, it allows us the possibility to return life back to normal. You know, when we look at some of these pictures, on the left over here, we have Marcus from Burger Rush. How many of you guys have been to Burger Rush? Everybody here that's been there absolutely loves it. I know I do. Marcus is doing his part. He's wearing a mask. Places like this don't have to shut down because we have a vaccinated population. We want that normalcy. We want things to be back the way they were before. And we can do that by vaccinations. When we look at the picture on the right, the Innings Festival, one of our special events, a great time where we can have everybody together. We can bring them in close. Uh, we can bring everybody in close, watch music outdoors, have a great time. These are the things that we want to return to in life that we really value. And that's why getting a vaccination is going to help your community. It's going to protect us. Um, it will protect all of us from, from having um, to, to go through that. And, and that's something to speak of when we look at the Indians Festival and special events returning to Tempe. Um, we're starting to get into that season coming into the fall where special events do return to Tempe. And one of the things to keep in mind when we were talking with uh, Maricopa County Department of Public Health epidemiologist, he was speaking about how, you know, it takes about five to six weeks for the vaccine really to get to full efficacy within the body and to, um, you know, have better protection. So if you think about that and the season that's coming around, now's the time to get the vaccination so that when the special events do come, you're better protected and you're protecting those around you. So that's something to keep in mind as we come into the season of special events. We've got usually Oktoberfest, Ironman, and, mm -hmm. and the, all the great events coming through here. So um, that's, you know, another another key piece that we're talking about with, you know, timeframes and when to get the vaccine. Now's the, now's the best time to get it. So how and where can I get the vaccine in Tempe? I know, Nick, you've done a tremendous amount of work when it comes to the pop-up vaccination clinics. If you could just, you know, briefly talk on these and let people know when and where, and then we... Uh, We'll yeah, there. absolutely. So today really starts a kickoff of a vaccination event that, that we had spoke about earlier. We want to we have a 75 percent vaccination rate goal by Labor Day for this city. Um, and we are putting a bunch of work in to make sure that happens. We, in fact, have vaccination pop up clinics starting today, this afternoon. The first one, four o'clock to six o'clock at J.C. Park. That's 805 West 5th Street. Not only are we offering vaccinations for people ages 18 and older for the Johnson & Johnson vaccination, but we're also providing free rapid COVID testing. So we ask that you bring your families out, you know, get tested, get a vaccination. Um, you know, these are free, free events. We're coming to you guys so that you don't have to, to make appointments at other places. Our strategy is, is to come to you to where you're going to be and make it as easy as possible. Um, one of our other uh, great, great partners within the community is Mountain Park Health. We're, uh, we have a, a vaccination clinic over there on Monday, August 23rd from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And that's at 1840 East Broadway. They do have COVID testing, but their testing is not going to be a, a rapid test. But over there, we're going to also give out uh, free food with food trucks. We're going to have fire trucks there. It's going to be a fun family event for, for all. So we ask you guys to come out. Uh, some of the other ones we have is, is Park After Dark on September 28th from 5 to 8 p.m. at uh, the 6th Street Park on Mill and 6th Street. And uh, Friday, August 27th from uh, 7.30 to 10.30. And Tuesday, August 31st from 4 to 6.30 p.m. 
We're having uh, uh, vaccination campaigns over at Tempe Community Accident Agency at 2146 East Apache Boulevard. Remember, testing is also free. It's rapid testing. Uh, please come out and, and bring your family. And one other uh, important thing I wanted to, to, to mention was at the Mountain Park Health one, uh, we're actually using the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine as well. So that one's gonna be open up for kids age 12 and older to get that vaccine. So we're asking you free, safe, easy, come out, get the family vaccinated and let's keep each other safe. Thank you so much. And now I am genuinely honored and excited to have the um, privilege to um, have Dr. Joshua LaBear join us, who is the executive director of ASU Biodesign Institute. He is one of the nation's foremost investigators in the rapidly expanding field of personalized diagnostics. His work is helping to provide early warning for those at risk of major illnesses, including cancer and diabetes. Dr. LaBear received the Arizona Bioscience Leader of the Year Award by AZ Bio in 2020 for his ability to bring teams together to address the world's greatest health challenges. Last year, ASU Biodesign Institute won Innovator of the Year at the Arizona Governor's Celebration of Innovation Awards. Dr. LeBaire has a medical degree and a doctorate in biochemistry and biophysics. He leads a team of hundreds of people who are fighting the pandemic every day. He ends each of their meetings with this rallying cry, Let's go save some lives. We know Dr. LeBaire and ASU Biodesign Institute have done just that. They have saved countless lives and our state and our world are grateful to their contributions for our safety and our health. Please welcome Dr. Joshua LeBaire, Arizona's own Dr. Fauci. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so Dr. LeBaire, can you please share with us um, some of the things that ASU Biodesign Institute um, has done within the community and some of the role within, within science and the community. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, the Biodesign Institute is uh, a research institute at ASU uh, devoted to solving problems in the world. And we, we have a, a broad remit. We work on a lot of different areas. Uh, certainly health is a big area for us. Uh, everything from early detection of disease, looking at how the immune system works, developing sensors to detect um, uh, the health of individuals. You've already heard a little bit about the wastewater testing that goes on at the Institute. And um, in addition to that, the Institute also works on all kinds of other things like uh, security. We have a team working on cybersecurity, for example. Uh, we have teams working on um, uh, sustainability of our planet, looking at the microbiomes of ourselves and the microbiomes of the planet and looking at um, ways in which we can use bacteria to purify water and make water safe for all of us. So lots of different research going on at the Institute, um, big focus on solving problems. And of course, we got very involved in responding to the pandemic. Uh, as you've heard, uh, our Institute developed a test for saliva testing, which we've done throughout the state of Arizona in virtually every county of the state. Uh, we continue to offer free public testing using saliva here. Just up at Skysong here, there's a, a, a place for the public to go get tested if they want to. Uh, and, and a lot of other activities. I won't go into all of them now, but um, we're pretty busy. So some things that we'd like to go through and, and we'll make this um, kind of informal like okay. we've, we've done before, just to ask questions and get some answers from your expertise and, and your knowledge base. Um, did the vaccines go through sufficient health and safety testing before being released for public distribution? I know there's been a lot of questions and concerns about how safe is this? Was it rushed? How does this process work? So if you could just, from your experience and your level, um, do, you know, was there sufficient health and safety testing when it comes to, to this being released to the public? Yep. Well, so the simple answer to that question, of course, is yes. Um, but let me go into a little bit more detail. So. Uh, you know, the, the, the Food and Drug Administration is an outstanding institution, and it sometimes frustrates people because they are so careful and they are so, in some people's minds, slow at, at going through the process of approving any kind of therapeutic that uh, people wish they could go faster. But they do that carefully because they want to make sure that everything is safe. Now, we're all aware that when we were facing this pandemic and people's lives were being lost at extraordinary rates, and let's not forget that the leading cause of death since the beginning of this pandemic in the United States is the coronavirus. That is the leading cause of death. It 
outpaced heart disease, it outpaced cancer, every other disease, it was the leading cause of death. So they, they, they wanted to do the, the testing for the, the vaccines in what they call an accelerated program. Um, and, and what does that mean? Well, the, typically when we approve drugs, we go through several phases. The first, first phase is, is to do what's called preclinical testing, and this is testing in animals, for example, to see if the, if the therapeutic we're using is safe. And, and to learn if there are any, any side effects, what those are, so that we can be prepared for them. <clears throat> then we go through phases one and two, which are our safety testing initially uh, to make sure that we identify what the side effects are. And then phase two is sort of more of that sort of safety testing, but kind of getting the doses right, figuring out what doses we should be giving people. And then finally, phase three is when we test for efficacy, and that's when we ask does the therapeutic do what we expect it to do? What was done here in the case of the accelerated testing for this vaccine was to combine phases one and two. Rather than do them one after the other, they did them at the same time. So looking for safety, looking for the right dose, they did that a little quicker. Um, then in, in July of 2020, we started phase three testing to look for efficacy. <clears throat> and, then, and, and yet that was still done on tens of thousands of people. So we need to be aware that um, the phase three testing was the same as we would do for any vaccine, tens of thousands of people comparing people who receive vaccine to people who receive placebo and asked, did the vaccine prevent people from getting any, any COVID-19? Um, but I think it's also important to remember that, that even from the Food and Drug Administration's perspective, testing does not end when they release the vaccine for public use. We continue to monitor how people who are getting it in the real world, in, in, in sort of real use testing, that is to say when people get it for the sake of pre prevention, how they do and do they have it? And, in, and we have to remember that to date now on the planet Earth, there have been 4.7 billion doses of vaccine given to people. 4.7 billion doses, almost 5 billion doses given on this planet. Not all of them from the same manufacturer, of course, but a huge number of, of tests have been done. In the United States alone, hundreds of millions of doses have been given for each of the different vaccines that are available in this. So, and, and the, we are watching how those people do very carefully. So there are programs to monitor how those individuals have done. And, and you know, this has got to be one of the most watched therapeutics, if not the most watched therapeutic in the history of our planet. Uh, and, and it is quite safe. So all to say that we have done a lot of watching of the, of, the, of the vaccines and people do fine with it. We know there are some side effects. People get some soreness in the arm. They can get fevers and chills. They can get headaches, sometimes nausea. Uh, typically, almost all, if not all of the symptoms are over within 48 hours. Few people have a little bit beyond that. Um, to our knowledge, there are no long-term side effects. People always raise this issue of long-term side effects of the vaccine and we have not observed any, and people have been looking very hard for them. So, um, you know, there's a very small number of people who get an allergic response. They, are, they get allergic to um, injections of, of many kinds, and for those people who get this, what's called anaphylaxis, we have to watch those closely, but those are rare. Those are on the order of the risk of lightning striking you. You know, we're talking about one or two individuals in a million who may have those kinds of responses, which is why when you get the vaccine, people ask you to stick around for 10 to 15 minutes to make sure you don't get one of those. And that's a good point. We do something similar with our vaccination clinics where we will have medical staff or, or emergency medical staff on standby for that 15 minute period to watch for any reactions. Um, so some vaccinated people are getting COVID-19. Why get vaccinated? I know that we've, we've briefly touched on that earlier, but you know, if you could dig down more into that discussion and let us know more <clears throat> why that occurs. Sure. That's a very good question. So let's first of all, keep in mind what the goal of the vaccines were. So we know that if you are unvaccinated and you get COVID-19, there's roughly a 20% risk of ending up in the hospital with it. That's one in five. That's, that's a gun with five chambers. One of them has a bullet in it. That's your chance of getting in the hospital. And we know that there's a one in 50 chance that you may die from the, vac from, from the virus. So the goal of the vaccine has and continues to be to prevent that, to prevent getting in the hospital and prevent dying from the virus. Of course, we want to prevent people from getting the virus altogether, but that wasn't the primary goal. 
So um, it is certainly true that there is a risk. Uh, we know that the, the vaccines are not perfect. No vaccine is ever perfect. And some people do still get vac do get um, the virus despite having been vaccinated. That said, um, we are seeing an extraordinary ability of these, vi these vaccines to prevent people from ending up in the hospital and from ending up uh, dying from the virus. In fact, if you look at who is in the hospital now in Arizona, who are dying from the virus now in Arizona, overwhelmingly, these are people who are unvaccinated. So the vaccines do an extraordinary job at preventing that. One thing that you always have to remember when you, when you talk about any therapeutic is you're looking at the value of the therapeutic versus the, the, the cost of not having taken the vaccine. What, what are the risks of not getting vaccinated? Because right now, I think what we're facing, uh, uh, the kind of the biggest uh, concern we have right now is the, the variant that we're seeing in the community now, which is called the Delta variant, which is a highly transmissible variant. It is much more transmissible than any of the variants we've seen to date. This virus is, if you're a, if you're a comic book fan, kind of like juggernaut. It just overwhelms the immune system, um, even to some extent in people who've been vaccinated initially. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you've been vaccinated and you do get the Delta variant, um, typically you will have high viral counts initially, but within a few days, your immune system, because it's been trained to see this, this virus, will kick in and the counts will drop very quickly and you'll get better much faster than if you, if you didn't. A little bit of this gets to what the vaccines do. And I know you guys have talked about this, but I'll just mention it briefly. It's, it's a little bit like, um, imagine if you have a criminal in your community um, and the criminal starts you know, either burglarizing homes or even worse in this case, you know, murdering people. Um, it takes a while for the police force to identify who's committing the crime and to alert everybody to look out for that individual so they can arrest them and stop them, right? What the, what the vaccine does, it essentially tells everybody up front, this criminal is in your system. It's coming around, be on the alert. So you don't have to go through that whole crime solving process. You know from the beginning, your body knows from the beginning what to look out for and can respond to it almost immediately. It, it basically tells us what the virus looks like so that our immune systems are prepared to do that. And, and, and that's why vaccinated people can respond quickly. Unvaccinated people take a, for 10 to 14 days to build up their immune response to the, to the vaccine. The other key piece of the vaccines that make them very helpful is that the vaccine is designed to stop the virus where it counts. So um, what the virus does to get into your system is the virus has effectively a key that binds to a specific lock on your cells that allows it to enter your cells and cause the infection. So imagine if you know the sort of business end of the key is these sort of little grooves here, right? This is the part of the protein, what's called the spike protein on the virus that actually enters the system. And in fact, coronavirus is named for the spike protein. If you look at a picture and you guys had one earlier, it looks like a ball with little spikes sticking out. Those spikes are the little keys that enter our cells. And what the vaccine does is it teaches the body to recognize just that part of the virus and, and antibodies bind to it and it essentially prevents the virus from getting into our cells. And so um, uh, uh, the, the vaccine only really teaches us that, but it teaches, that's the most important part to teach us. So the, the antibodies in our blood systems are really designed to prevent that part, the, the invasion of the, the virus into cells. Uh, that is a great way to explain oh, I need to go on. That is a great way to explain it. And thank you so much for breaking that down in a way that we can understand it um, a tremendous amount. Um, so we talked about, you said, you know, the common side effects. And I know that there was the question earlier, the myth about um, women who are getting pregnant. Is there any additional information that you would have considering that? Right. So this has been looked at pretty carefully, uh, uh, the vaccines in pregnant women. I think the first thing that we have to remember, and again, every decision we make about therapeutics or vaccination is we're weighing the risks of the vaccine, which are minimal, to the risks of the virus, which are pretty severe. Um, if, if someone in the community gets this virus, they are exposed to a disease in their lifetime that's the most likely to put them in the hospital of any disease they probably ever had. That's how dangerous this virus is. And this virus is particularly dangerous in pregnant women. So pregnant women, because their bodies are so devoted to other activities, like you know, the development of the baby, 
um, they are at risk for the, 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 the effects of the virus. And for we don't yet know what the risks are to the baby, but we suspect that they are severe as well. So the, uh, the, the vaccine prevents that. Uh, the vac certainly vaccines in women who have not yet gotten pregnant, absolutely beneficial, but also um, uh, there's been a lot of data looking at women who have been pregnant when they got the vaccine. There has been no observation of untoward effects. And in fact, it has reduced their risk of getting infected um, and overall leading to the health of both the, the woman herself and her baby. Excellent. So it actually even supports it more that yes. how important and significant it is to protect not only the mother, but also the child, protect That's the right. child. Um, so why are masks advisable regardless of the vaccination status? I know that everybody loves to wear masks these days and, and have throughout the time period from going maskless to wearing masks again. But why, right. why is it advisable to still wear a mask regardless of vaccination? Right. Well, you know, um, uh, as everyone knows, the CDC was hopeful a while back. They thought that um, once you're vaccinated, you probably don't need to wear a mask anymore. Uh, but that was before we encountered this Delta variant. And that, uh, the, uh, let me just briefly comment on what we mean by variants. Um, uh, viruses over time accumulate mutations. Um, a virus is, if you will, a little bit like a piece of paper in an office that says, copy me. And our cells see this thing and they just make copies because the virus told us to. And, uh, but the process of making the copy is not perfect. Uh, every, because we're talking about, you know, many, many thousands of, of, of individual uh, letters that have to be copied. Once in a while, mistakes get made and, a, and, a, and an inappropriate letter gets put in there. Um, it turns out that this particular virus, um, SARS-CoV-2, is not um, uh, prone to a lot of mutation. In fact, it actually is one of the few viruses we know about that actually has a proofreading ability. It actually goes back and checks to make sure it's making a good copy. So mutations are not common with coronavirus, but the number of copies of this virus on planet Earth is extraordinarily high. There are just so many copies because there are just so many people infected and every one of them is making lots of copies of the virus. Sooner or later, it's inevitable that mistakes will get made. And sooner or later, one of those mistakes will make a virus that's better at being a virus than other copies. And that's what happened in the case of the Delta variant. Uh, errors were made. Um, a virus was produced that makes very high copy numbers of virus, even more than the first virus that, were, that we were encountered. And this particular virus gets those copy numbers earlier in the infection, when people don't even know they're infected. So they get exposed, they start making high copy numbers of this virus, and they um, don't even know that they've got it. And at this point, whenever they speak, just like we're doing now, we make around 3,000 droplets of saliva that come out of our mouths per second. So when we speak, we're constantly shedding little droplets of saliva that are going into the air and carrying along with them copies of the virus. And this particular virus, the Delta virus, just gets out there so fast. And so um, even, even people who are vaccinated can get an, an, an initial infection from this virus until their antibodies have a chance to kick in, until their, their memory cells, which make even more antibody kick in, and while they have that infection, they are themselves now producing high copy numbers of the virus. And we have seen that at BioDesign in our saliva test. We have seen vaccinated individuals making very high copy numbers of virus initially. Within a few days, their bodies will get hold of it. Their bodies will start shutting it down because, they're, because their systems have seen images of that perpetrator. They know that it's there and they start pre preventing it. But right away, they'll have it, and that's why we're wearing masks. We're wearing masks to protect one another um, from those high copy numbers of virus and to protect ourselves from getting that infection initially. Um, one thing we haven't talked a lot about today is what people are beginning to observe with this virus is that some people who get this virus can get a post-viral syndrome. So they may get over their initial infection, but then a month or two later, they have sometimes neuropsychiatric symptoms, sometimes respiratory symptoms, other things can kick in. And of course, we don't want that to happen either. And so right now we're recommending mask wearing when you're indoors and near other people, particularly in a crowded situation so that you don't get the virus. And so speaking of the vaccine as we have been today, um, and I know there's still some research with it, but 
how long does the vaccine last? And, and there's been a lot of, you know, discussion and testing and, and information, I believe, in the news um, is the best way to put it. Should we be getting booster shots? Um, so if you could just speak to that. Sure. So there's a lot of information coming out, especially right now, about booster shots. Let me take what we know the most about, and we'll talk about what we know a little bit less about. What we know the most about, and I've, I've seen these data because our one of our one of the research projects in, in my own laboratory is the serology of COVID-19. That is to say, the antibodies we produce against this virus. And what we have observed is that in, in a number of people who have um, compromised immune systems, they do not make as much antibody as most of us do. People who are getting chemotherapy right now or who have ongoing cases of cancer people who have an inherited disorders of immune systems, um, people who have had something called CAR-T therapy, which is a treatment for cancer that reduces the immune system, um, uh, certain medications like steroids, which suppress the immune system, people who, for one reason or another, have compromised immune systems, they do eventually respond to the vaccine. They do make antibodies to the vaccine but it takes them much longer. And what we have seen is that if they get that third dose, that booster dose, it goes up considerably and it protects them better against the virus. So there, the FDA has now authorized the use of a booster dose for those people who have um, reduced immune systems. Um, that's, we know that and we're confident about that result. Now you asked another question, which is what about healthy people? Do they, do they need booster shots? And the answer is we don't quite yet know. Um, you can look at people who've been vaccinated. A lot of folks, um, people who are first responders, for example, people who are um, in clinical care got their doses back in December and January. So it's now been eight months since they had their dose. And if you look in their bloodstreams, you will see a little bit of a drop of antibody uh, compared to if you measured them right after they got their vaccine. It's not as much as you think they still have pretty good levels even eight months later. So they are, there's plenty of immunity. They may not have enough to prevent that initial infection from a Delta variant. They may get that initial infection, but they have other things that come to play. First of all, their antibodies will kick in and will reduce the infection. Secondly, they have what are called memory cells. These cells are the cells that make the antibody. And when the body sees, you know, the virus floating around, those kick in and start making more antibody and that protects them. And then they have what's called cellular immunity, a whole different branch of the immune system that also protects them. And all of that combined is why if we look in the hospitals today in Arizona and you look at who's there, they are not people who are vaccinated. They are people who are unvaccinated. So even since January, we have plenty of good protection against hospitalizations. All of that said, there may be some advantage to a booster shot, which would kind of kick the antibody levels up. And I think we're collecting those data now and we'll see uh, if a recommendation is forthcoming about that. But that is extremely promising to hear about those who have that immunocompromised or who are being yes. treated for cancer or anything else, um, to be able to have that additional protection and get them up to the level as some of, of the rest of us. So that's very positive and very happy to hear that. Obviously, we uh, the the stadiums out in Glendale, and we don't have the big testing sites at stadiums anymore. Um, we do have them around the valley, but is that because testing is lo no longer necessary, or is it still necessary to have testing around here? I think testing is really valuable, and I think we're going to need more of it now. Um, you know, when the when the when the counts of the cases were really dropping early, uh, in, you know, late in May, early in June, and we were down to you know, let's say, four hundred cases a day in the entire state of Arizona. There wasn't so much of a demand on testing. But now, as you know, we're well over 2,700, over 2,800 cases a day in the state. And, and that's only the, and that's with not enough testing. And so if we did more testing, those numbers, we'd probably see that there are really more cases than that, even in the state. So we do need more testing. And, and actually, Biodesign is ramping up its testing capabilities. Uh, we're bringing more people into the lab. We're going to get more going. And um, we would recommend, you know, as much testing as we can. Testing not only tells us where the virus is, but it also, um, at least in, at, at our university, actually suppressed the case numbers because people kind of behaved a little bit better when they knew that it was around. And I think 
testing kind of reminds us that it's here and that we need to be careful. And I, I just want to reflect on the, the images that you saw or some of our fine folks over at the AOC Biodesign Institute and showing how some of that testing process occurs. That's our lab. That's fantastic. And um, glad to hear also that we're bumping up the, the testing that's happening around, um, around the valley. So um, COVID-19 is serious on its own, as, as we can see with the slide. Um, and we have talked a little bit about the variants. What can you tell us about these and, and why are future variants even more concerning? Right, so the, by the way, the picture you're looking at is a picture of coronavirus and you can see those sort of spike proteins sticking out. Those are the kind of keys that allows the virus to get into our cells. Um, and you know, we talked a little bit about this, the sheer number of viruses on our planet um, the more viruses there are, the more mathematical opportunities there are for viruses to accumulate mutations that allow them to do one of several things. In the case of the Delta variant, it allows the, the, the virus to create high copy numbers and to um, uh, basically um, uh, spread more easily among, from person to person because it infects people quicker and gets those numbers up faster. There are possibilities that, that these viruses could find ways around the vaccine. They could not bind as well to the antibodies that the vaccine induces. The good news there um, is that the, the, the manufacture of these vaccines allows us to make modifications to catch up with any variants that occur, but we really don't wanna have to do that. What we really wanna do is just get this thing out of here. And the best way to do that and the best way to prevent variants in general is just lower the viral burden on our planet. And the best way to do that is to vaccinate people. The more people that are vaccinated, the fewer copies of virus there will be in our community, in our country, in the world. And, and as those numbers get down, then the, the opportunities for the virus to mutate go down with it. Excellent. And so as, as you are, you know, busy over at ASU. Um, how active is ASU in the COVID-19 research currently? I mean, we, we have all kinds of research going on. You have a picture of Rolf Halden here. Um, his lab is the lab that's been doing the wastewater testing for, for COVID-19. Um, there are a number of laboratories, including mine, that are looking at the, the immune response to the virus. Um, um, we, um, the United States has a major effort uh, along serology testing driven by the National Institutes of Health called what's called SeroNet for serological network. And um, ASU is one of four nationwide capacity building centers. So only four centers in the whole country were selected to lead this effort in, in developing a high capacity for doing serology testing. And then SeroNet has a number of other outstanding research groups that are doing more focused projects throughout there. So we're doing that. We have a number of laboratories. Um, Ephraim Lim's laboratory is looking at the variants. He's one of the key sequencing labs in the state and in the country. And he, is, he, he takes the very samples that we have from our saliva testing and he sequences them to learn what variants are, are around in our community. Um, we have Brenda Hogue, who was a coronavirus expert even before the pandemic happened. And she's un trying to understand better ways to understand what the, how this virus behaves and people like Bert Jacobs and Grant McFadden are, are, uh, uh, and Arvin Varsani are coming up with new ways to make vaccines, uh, probably next generation vaccines that may even improve on what we currently have. So lots of activity going on. Well, I can definitely see how uh, there was the innovation award for sure based on that amount of information when it comes to uh, the coronavirus, but just everything that the ASU Biodesign Institute is doing and quite commendable. So thank you for everything oh. that you are doing. Um, so now I am checking with Chris to see if we have any questions that have come in. We had one about the booster shot and whether or not people should get it, but I do believe that Dr. LeBaire answered that one. And thank you to Pamela Winfrey, Winfrey for asking that. Okay. Um, we do have some questions from the community that did come in prior to the event. So we have put this out um, and made it... Um, open for anybody who wanted to send them in prior to the event occurring. So we're gonna go through those now. Um, the first one I am gonna to turn to um, Chief Ells and ask how many deaths have occurred from the vaccine? Well, this is, uh, I guess we can, we can actually file this one under um, 
you know, the, the, the Mythbusters thing as well, because um, when we look at this, we have a, a system that reports um, any vaccination, uh, it's called VAERS. And whenever there's, there's any side effects or, or anything that, that could possibly be wrong with the vaccination, it's a reportable system so that we can look into it, investigate it, um, so on and so forth. Um, so we have to, out of about 351 million vaccinations, we've had in the, in the neighborhood of about 6,700 deaths. Now, that's reported to VAERS. What people are leaving out is the fact that those 6,700 deaths occurred within a certain time frame of receiving the vaccination. And those could be anything from uh, fall injury, cancer, a heart attack, a gunshot wound, stuff like that that has nothing to do with the primary symptom of being COVID-19. In fact, when we break this down, um, the only deaths that I'm aware of, and, and Dr. LeBear might have a better idea, are the three that we had from the Johnson & Johnson shot from uh, a thrombosis uh, that occurred. And, uh, you know, Johnson Johnson and, and FDA, they, and, uh, they all did a great job of shutting it down for a couple of weeks to figure out exactly the correct treatment for it. Um, when you, when you were one of those, uh, people that fell into the, the risk category. And when I say risk category, um, you know, 351 million vaccinations. When you look at that, that your risk is incredibly low. It, it actually turns out to, to be 0.0000011% chance of, of being that um, in that, that category. So um, when deaths, deaths that occurred from the vaccine, um, I think right now, three is, is the correct number. I mean, I could be wrong, Dr. I, I think the, I, I, it's, it's extraordinarily low. I mean, as we've talked about, you know, there's this risk of, of, of allergic reaction, but people are mm -hmm. waiting for that. They're prepared for that and they treat it and people still come out okay. I think we probably should compare that. A much higher number of people die from Tylenol every year right? than die from these vaccines. Much, much riskier drug is Tylenol than, than the vaccine. Yep. And for those at home who are wondering what just happened, I forgot to unmute. So apparently it's similar to being on a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and uh, so the question that was asked uh, and the answer that was given was how many deaths have occurred from the vaccine, which you just got the answer for. My apologies for that. I will, uh, I will make sure I'm off mute when we ask these <laughs> right. questions. These questions are from the community. So the great uh, explanation that we had um, was for, if we had questions from the community, we offered that up prior to the event occurring. We did have some that were sent in. And I believe Chris says that we do have one from the community currently. We have one more from Carlos Dixon. Um, he says, I was curious why all my COVID-19 testing always comes up negative. I had five or six tests and they came back that way, but my family came back positive and I came back with COVID-19 an antibodies months later. So if you want to think about that while we go through some of these other questions or answer it now, either way. Yeah, you know, um, I, you know, it's hard in an individual case to know why the test may have been negative. It's possible that this individual had COVID-19 and was one of the asymptomatic cases uh, because that, you know, this is just an extraordinary virus, which ranges from people not even knowing that they have it to people dying from it. It's, you can't think of a broader range than that. And, and that, that person may have, have had uh, uh, an asymptomatic case and then later on developed antibodies. Um, it's just very hard to know. Um, maybe perhaps when the time was when they, when they took the samples, they either missed it or they just didn't have enough counts, or maybe it wasn't when he actually had the case. I think that's a good, there's a good point with that is because of the symptomatic versus asymptomatic and when somebody actually could have coronavirus is just, you know, unless you're testing right then and there during that time frame of, of having it, it's very difficult. So thank you for the question. Um, to proceed forward with the other questions that we received from the community, um, we'll be, I'll turn back over to Chief Els again. For how many incidents other than death have occurred from the vaccine? Well, out of the uh, 351 vaccinations, uh, vaccinated Americans that, that we're looking at right now, uh, I think the numbers that, that I have down here are about 39 reports of thrombosis or uh, thrombocytopenia. 
um, which is a clotting disorder, and I believe it's in females older than 50. Is that correct, Doc? Or yeah, younger than 50? Young, younger women uh, sometimes have a risk of, of blood clots for this particular, and I think you're primarily talking about the adenovirus vaccine. Yes, the adenovirus yeah, the, one. the two mRNA vaccines don't really have that risk. And just for clarification, the two mRNA ones are the Pfizer and the Moderna. Right. And just to remember, the 351 million is, I think you just remember, that's how many people have been vaccinated. That, which is an incredibly high number. And then when we look at uh, some of the other things that, that have popped up on, on the radar, 155 uh, reports preliminary of the Guillain-Barre uh, Guillain syndrome and 730 uh, cases or reports of myocarditis or pericarditis. Um, one of, one of the, uh, the doctors that I spoke with um, talked about, especially with the Gillian Bear, we don't know exactly because of how many people have actually been vaccinated that this could be a random right. number of, um, of just people that had it and didn't know about it and maybe discovered it now that they have the vaccine. Yeah. But we don't have anything tied exactly to that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I'm just going to just, the pronunciation is Guillaume Barre. Guillaume Barre. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. It's a French. Uh, yes. So um, yeah, the, it's, this is a syndrome where people get, uh, uh, it's a neurological syndrome and, and they get weakness in, in some of the facial muscles and um, uh, it, it happens. Uh, it happens in healthy people as well. And I don't know that we've necessarily proven that the vaccines cause it. Um, it may be just that you know, they both, uh, we used to say true, true and unrelated in medicine. They both happen in the same person, but maybe not related to each other. Mm -hmm. So moving on to our next question uh, that came from our community members is, is it true that a vitamin D deficiency was found in many of the patients that died of COVID-19? And I know when we talk about vitamin D deficiency, um, there's a good percentage of us that have vitamin D deficiency walking around every day. And um, the fact that, you know, probably has been found in multiple people, whether it's cardiac problems or respiratory problems yes. or, or diabetes or anything else, you know, you'll find that vitamin D deficiency. So specific to COVID-19 and saying that, you know, that's, you know, a, an indicator. Most of our people who are hospitalized, most of our elderly, elderly population, myself, I'm working on it, Doc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me, me too. Me too. We're yeah, you know, um, we, we produce vitamin D in response to sunshine, um, but you, it turns out you have to get quite a bit of it to, to produce enough vitamin D. And um, frankly, there are other reasons why you don't want to get that much sunshine in Arizona because it has other negative effects like skin cancer. So a lot of people um, uh, are vitamin D deficient in our community and, uh, and it's a simple enough thing to manage. You just take a pill and you're good to go. Um, but um, there was some in initial interest in whether vitamin D deficiency was causing some people to have worse outcomes with the coronavirus. Um, what I've seen so far has not supported that. Uh, it doesn't look like vitamin D is really related to outcome in this illness. So we're not sure what to make of that yet. So I'm sure with, as with everything, since it's continuing to be researched, we'll hear more about that possibly in the future yes. as as you know, studies and research continues around the, the coronavirus pandemic. Are there, and so I am going to go to Dr. Libera for this. Are there any treatments uh, like Avermectin? Is that correct, Avermectin, yeah. um, that aren't being used? Well, I mean, <clears throat> uh, as we've heard over the course of this whole pandemic, a number of therapies, things like chloroquine, were proposed to be important in the treatment of the illness and have just not panned out in clinical trials as being effective at, at managing this, uh, managing, the, managing the virus. That said, other therapies like steroids have turned out to be pretty useful in managing some of the effects of the steroids in certain people with the appropriate um, needs. So we're, we're gonna have to see what, what works better and better. We have, we have gotten much better at managing this, the viral illness, at least the immediate viral illness than we, than we were when this first broke. Uh, uh, you know, for example, we realize now you don't want to start oxygen too soon, for example. Um, sometimes that can be worse than, than not. So we, we have to, you know, we'll continue to learn how to manage it better over time. Um, and maybe better therapies will come out. But of course, the best thing we can do is prevent it from the beginning. 
and that is by getting vaccinated. Because if you get vaccinated, you won't need any of those things. Excellent. And then I believe, unless we have any other questions from the community, Chris? No. Okay. So our final question from the community um, is, is the protein spike from mRNA gene therapy harmful to internal organs in the long term? So, yeah, there was a question that came in about this. And I think um, there may be some misconceptions about a paper that was published a long time ago, unless there's another paper that I'm not aware of. Um, this was a paper where, um, well, let me start by saying that what the, the mRNA vi vaccines do is they encode a part of that spike protein that we looked at a moment ago. They don't actually encode the entire protein. They only encode what's called the receptor binding domain. And and that's the jagged part of the, the, the part of the protein that actually fits in the lock of our cells that where the virus actually inserts itself into our bodies. Um, uh, and so uh, there was a paper that published out of Europe where they were looking at an autopsy of an 86 year old individual who had, it turns out, probably got the virus after having had one dose of a two dose regimen. So as you may all remember, um, it takes two doses of the mRNA vaccines to get a full uh, uh, protection against the virus. This person had had only one of those two doses and contracted the virus about two weeks later, which wasn't even a full first dose, if you will, and, and probably got the virus. And when they looked, um, they found evidence of the virus in a number of vital organs. That doesn't surprise anyone. The, this virus, once it's in the body, will start to invade all over the place. In fact, most recently now, there's evidence that this virus even gets into the brain through a different mechanism. So classically, we think of this virus as going in through a protein called ACE2 or ACE2. Um, the virus that gets into the brain cells probably gets in through a different mechanism. Um, so um, that was not an effect of the vaccine at all. That was the virus itself that was causing uh, the evidence in these, in these organs. Um, from the, as we said earlier, there's just no evidence. Um, you know, the, the, the vaccine is made from an RNA and it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, uh, it, it digests in your cells. It's there for about 24, 48 hours and then it's gone. Um, the, the mRNA does not, there's nothing to keep it around. It gets digested by proteins in the, in the body that, that actually eat RNA. And so, um, what, what was observed in this particular autopsy was, the virus because this person got infected. Thank you so much for that. And I know that we do have um, additional questions for Dr. LaBear this afternoon, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandy Keaton Leander, Assistant Director for Media Relations with Arizona State University um, to assist with those follow-up questions for Dr. LaBear. Thank you. Uh, we just had a few questions from members of our press. Um, uh, quite a few of them are familiar with Dr. LeBear and the many press conferences over the last year. So um, in the middle of this surge, more people are needing to get tested. And so with what scientists currently know about the Delta variant, is the incubation period and symptoms showing differently from previous variants? Yeah, so that's, that's a really great question. Um, the, the, um, I think one of the characteristics of the Delta variant is that it seems to take hold faster when people get exposed to it, and it seems to appear in, in our nasopharynx, you know, sort of where we spread the virus from earlier. And so we, you know, we typically would tell people if you got exposed to the earlier versions of this virus, that um, if you went and got tested the day after you got exposed, you might not find it, and yet you still may have the virus because the virus kind of goes quiet for a little while until it builds up enough that you can uh, see it. And so you would tell people, if you think you got exposed on a particular day, get tested around four days later. And that way um, you'll, have a, you'll really make sure that it hasn't been lying quietly and now it has appeared. Um, it probably appears a, maybe a, even a day earlier if it's the Delta. And so you might even see this virus by three days. That said, I would probably tell people best to test it after four days, just in case it, you know, you, you didn't get a heavy inoculum is the term we use for the amount of virus you get. And I would say, you know, it's still probably a good idea to get tested in four days. I wouldn't wait necessarily till five days because by then you're probably spreading it everywhere. 
And then the final question, you, know, you covered the second. So when should people use a rapid test or a PCR test? Right. So I, I happen, you know, our lab uses the PCR test. It's the more accurate of the tests. It, it um, misses less. It's, it, it's better at identifying the virus. The rapid tests measure something called the antigen. It's the proteins of the virus. And they have, a, a, they're not particularly good if you don't have any symptoms. If you have symptoms, the rapid test is fine. If you don't have symptoms, the rapid test could miss the fact that you actually have the virus, but just don't have the, the proteins around. So we usually, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in the, in the PCR test, but the rapid test can definitely be useful if you have symptoms. And in that case, if you have symptoms and it's negative, you're probably okay. Thank you. And I just want to thank everybody. This was some incredible information here today and truly, truly honored to be um, sitting here with you, Dr. LeBaron. And, and um, thank you so much, Sandy, for coming as well. Um, Chief Els, again, tremendous amount of information. Um, for those who would like to continue to follow what is occurring with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, please visit the following sites. These are online resources that we have available and that we will continue to make available, continue to update um, as we proceed through this pandemic um, so that we can make sure that you all have the accurate information um, to make informed decisions for yourselves. And one of the things we, we obviously continue to stress today is how important and how significant it is to get vaccinated. Um, again, we're trying to reach a goal of 70 75% or greater for the, um, all the citizens in Tempe. Um, through all the zip codes by Labor Day. So we're going to continue to reinforce that message. Um, I would like to give, um, again, a special thank you to ASU's Biodesign um, Institute and everything that they've done throughout this, um, this pandemic and through everything prior to that. You guys are, are truly amazing and we're grateful to have you within our own community and doing the work that you're doing um, out there. So um, in conclusion, um, unless any of my, my colleagues would have anything else they'd like to say, I just wanna thank you all um, for being present here today, for joining us. And um, one of the messages is that we're really trying to push out is don't wait to vaccinate. Um, make sure that you go out and get vaccinated. Friends, family, um, try to push out the information that you received here today. If you have additional questions or concerns, um, please feel free to type those into the Facebook chat or if we have additional um, to reach out to us, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions. Um, and again, we, we truly appreciate you being here today. So don't wait, vaccinate and um, be safe out there.